Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the latest in this season's School of Management book series. My name is Steve Brammer. I'm the Dean of the School of Management. It's an enormous privilege and a pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon, or indeed whatever time of day it is, wherever you are. Um, our book series is a series of events in which we celebrate and explore recent books written by members of our School of Management community. The series gives us an opportunity to hear from leading experts about their books and provide audiences with an opportunity to pose questions and engage directly with the book's authors. It's lovely to see uh, those of you who've attended today with us. Today, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome uh, a, a wonderful uh, member of our community of alumni, uh, Alison Goldsworthy, to talk about her book, Poles Apart, Why People Turn Against Each Other and How to Bring Them Together. And I, uh, I have my heavily marked up copy. It's a really fantastic read. So uh, do, do get out there and, uh, and buy that book and, and get stuck in. Before we get into the meat of today's event, the conversation between uh, Alison and myself, uh, a couple of items of housekeeping. First of all, we're very keen that uh, participants get to put uh, questions directly to Alison. The way to do that is through the Q&A function. Once Alison and I have chatted for 35 or 40 minutes, um, discussing polls apart, I'll open the floor to questions. So do please uh, contribute. Always we discover, uh, colleagues spend the first 30 minutes or so um, listening to the conversation and digesting it, uh, and people don't raise questions until quite late on. That means we get a big flurry of questions towards the end, and we don't always have time then to uh, uh, get you answers to all of them. So as a question arises in your mind, do please um, do please raise it. Um, participants can also like vote for questions, those that get likes and votes, uh, as is true in the contemporary world, perhaps more, more on which in a minute, um, uh, those questions will rise to the top of the list. So feel free to, if someone's asked a question that you'd like an answer to, to, to signal that. It's, it's a very enormous pleasure, not least because um, in my first stint at the University of Bath, I had the enormous pleasure and privilege of uh, being Alison's personal tutor while she was an undergraduate with us uh, to welcome uh, Ali Goldsworthy to talk about Poles Apart. Ali has uh, a really fascinating uh, life story that we'll get to grips with, I think, some part of this afternoon. Uh, Ali has been a political advisor and campaigner for more than 20 years. Uh, she's former deputy chair of the Liberal Democrats, uh, and she led the team that built the fastest growing campaigning organisation in the UK. In 2017, she was a Sloan Fellow at Stanford, co-creating its first depolarisation course. A board member of the Joseph Rowntree Reform Trust and a senior associate of the Intellectual Forum, Jesus College, Cambridge, Alison has won numerous awards for her work. She has written for the Telegraph, Independent, New Statesman, Times and Financial Times. So truly uh, an enormous um, figure in commentary on polarisation. Today, Alison and I talk about uh, her book, Poles Apart, Why People Turn Against Each Other and How to Bring Them Together. Now, as I say, available on uh, every great bookshelf uh, and uh, also on digital providers. Welcome, Ali. It's an enormous pleasure to have you with us today. Steve, thank you for that lovely introduction, and it's really nice to be here and to be um, talking to people around the world as well. Wonderful. Well, let's let's kick off with with a, an, a, an obvious opener. I say start off at ten, but I've realised that's too idiomatic these days. So, uh, <laughs> an, an obvious initial question: Tell us a little bit about uh, what motivated you to to write the book. Where did you get your ideas from? Uh, who's the book for? So the book is for um, everybody that is concerned about how we appear to be dividing as a society and who wants to try and do something about it. Um, but that can really include business leaders, people in politics, people who lead organisations in civil society, people who are, are, who are worried about how we cohesively all sit together and how we all could get along a bit better even when we, when we disagree. I guess I started writing the book for a couple of reasons, which is, you know, as you say, I, my background is, is 
in movement building or when I'm lazy I used to call it troublemaking with which you have some familiarity uh, from when we first knew each other um, and you know I used to to love that work I still do love that work um, and I was pretty good at it at bringing about change as a consequence but I never and often you win campaigns by being divisive as well and I never thought about how I might heal some of those divides that I would create actually and there's an entire raft of people often enabled by tech doing that and I came out here to Stanford first I I saw some of the effects of that with the Remain campaign in the UK I'm from a leave voting part of Wales um, and we're really concerned how suddenly all my Remain friends seem to or not all of them but a lot of my Remain friends seem to brand everybody who voted leave racist so only seeing bad in them and good in their own side and then you'd see exactly the same thing um, with Trump and with Trump supporters out here in the US when I was here. And I just became really interested about how you could try and resolve that and began to feel a bit guilty. And as conflicts extended into other worlds, you know, there's definitely something that, you know, I was a political activist in the business school, not in a Pulsai department. And again, here at Stanford, like you could see it hitting business. And how did business leaders respond in a divided society? And what if they'd contributed to it? So all of those things were what really went into the book. And I found that there were very few people exploring this space, or and particularly even fewer exploring that space who had any kind of answers. Yeah, I mean, certainly you were a troublemaker. So, so you, you say you say uh, you left back and, and went on to become a semi-professional troublemaker. What's the most trouble you made in your old life? <laughs> well, I guess given we're at business school, um, and it wasn't always an adversarial relationship, but the the big movement that I I built was at which. Um, and I would argue that this was entirely legitimate trouble, um, but we led the campaign that got nuisance callers or robocallers um, that changed legislation around that and made it harder to crack down on them, including, particularly, and this was really unusual, for company directors to be held personally liable up to half a million dollars if they were found to be repeatedly flouting legislation. And it was amazing how quickly company directors who previously said they had no knowledge of these marketing activities that were going on, um, how suddenly they changed their tune there. So that was, that was definitely a very fun piece of trouble uh to make which i i enjoyed and we we engaged and surprisingly millions and millions of people in that campaign polls apart i mean it's a really fantastic book i do, I do recommend it to people you know at its heart you know the, the the genesis of it is this idea that people are naturally prone to sort of stratified group see the world through yeah. groups and identities um and the world does seem these days you know particularly you know given events in the last week or so uh, at, at such a profoundly and intensely fractured place um why why is that and what sorts of problems and issues does that cause yeah so i think you know and there are times when people collaborate and cooperate and get on as well obviously like but that's and we come on to that in other parts of the book but there's a few things that can create an environment where we are more likely to be groupish in how we think and seek our groups for reassurance and one of them is about certainty or uncertainty so you often see this if you know someone's got a little kid who's uncertain they'll go back to their mum and dad for a bit of reassurance because they want something familiar that will tell them that they feel good or that they're right so in uncertain times like for example a global pandemic you tend to spend more time with people who will make you feel good and that tends to be people who agree with you um, other things that can exist exacerbate and highlight divisions between people, things like growing gaps between rich and poor or higher unemployment levels, both of which are, are almost certainly on the way as a consequence of pandemic borrowing. And that's before we wrote the book, before the events of the last week with what's going on in Ukraine um, and things from there. When resources get scarce, people often become more likely to, to fight um, and to argue over them. Everybody will be familiar with that thing. And all of this is coming with, with climate change. So sort of the underlying part of your question is, is kind of are things going to get better or worse, I suppose? And yeah. the answer there is, is probably, unfortunately, that things are going to get worse before they get better. But this is not the first time in our history that we've polarised, and neither is it the worst. Some people like to talk about hyperbole, but you, you don't have to go back too far in European history to find many examples of where people have polarised more. Um, and hopefully, hopefully, you know, that will be the pattern that we go through this time, but it, it, it doesn't happen by accident. 
Yeah, and no, absolutely. I was I one one thing I was struck by as I, I read the book was was the the old Honda advert. You know, hate something, change something, make something better. And I was thinking, you know, I mean, polarization. It seems to me is or you know, kind of uh, you, ha- you have this term affective po- polarization in in the book. Um, sometimes is a force for bad and sometimes is a force for good. And it seems to me one of the great challenges in all of this is, is how you get the level of balance in that and how you tell the difference between good polarization or good, you know, good uh, diversity of views and uh, on the other hand, kind of bad diversity of views. Have you got a view on, you know, how do I tell the difference between is all polarization bad or is or is or is yeah, and how do I know the difference between good and bad polarization? Some polarization is really good and really helpful. It would be really boring if we all agreed on everything all of the time and there'd not be very much innovation. And um, uh, there's the, you touched on effective polarization. So there's lots of people when you talk about polarization think that it's between two different issues. You know, I'm pro or anti free trade or I'm pro choice or pro life or things like that. And people can sit in different places on that spectrum. We tend to think of it as quite binary, but it's it's not. That's that's a normal, healthy, important part of a functioning democracy um, with what goes on. Effective polarization is where you see someone from a different group and you instinctively like like or dislike them based on the group that they are that they are part of and that can become quite tricky the point when I say that it gets really unhealthy in the book is when it spills over in a significant I'm in a slightly academic environment way here so in a statistically significant way to other areas so um, that can include everything from how likely you are to believe someone has committed a crime um, to uh, the things that you you purchase and what you do, to how effectively people are scrutinised in corporate governance, um, through to the health recommendations that doctors give people. If someone thinks someone is likely, this is a US stat, but if someone thinks someone's likely to be um, a Republican and they come to them with, it's a woman normally coming to them with a um, pregnancy that they don't want, they'll be less likely to recommend to them that abortion could be an option they go for, irrespective of all of the health concerns. And I really do not believe that someone's health options should be determined by the political affiliation someone thinks they are. And I suppose the other underlying point there is, you know, doctors are generally pretty smart people. Um, I understand professors are even slightly smarter. Um, But, (laughs) but, um, you know, everybody is affected by it. And there's actually some evidence, it's not quite as rigorous, but that the more educated you are, the more... um, the more you are likely to be taken in by effective polarization and the more likely you are to try and judge people with what goes on, partly because you spent more time studying or looking at how groups of people behave and you'll be reassuring yourself and self-referencing. But yes, no one is impervious to these effects. Mm. Uh, I, I, I will leave the comment about professors on one side. I, I don't know. I don't know that we are, <laughs> we are smarter. I mean, one of the interesting things you say in, in the early part of the book that, that I found fascinating was was that people, you know, and I did the quiz online. Um, I, I was struck by the, the fact that people are not very good at evaluating their own characteristics. Right. We're, we're not terribly reflexive. Um, uh, at evalu- you know, I might say I'm open-minded, I might say I'm flexible and willing to change and willing to be persuaded, but actually, you know, more often than not, I'd be overestimating that were I to express that view. Can you say something about, about um, the importance of people slightly kind of misperceiving their own attributes and attitudes and the role that plays in polarisation? Yeah, so I think everybody would like, or most people like to think of themselves as open minded. And instinctively, everybody is more generous to their own themselves and their own side than they are to other sides with what's what's going on. And, you know, it it can be slightly more more complex than that. And Steve mentions the quiz, which I'll stick in the the comments at at the minute. We went through the British election study and um, got people to try and predict how someone would have voted based on other characteristics. Mm -hmm. And we didn't even really need to fudge it at all to try and get this quiz to make it really hard for people to show and they pick up that you know someone lived in a certain part of the country or an age or a gender or religion that they followed and would presume that they voted a certain way as a consequence and actually they get it wrong quite a lot of the time so the average score is about three out of seven on these quizzes I don't know how how you did I got four (laughs) I got four well congratulations on it and look how happy you are that you beat the average well I'm I'm a very simple soul (laughs) 
Um, but there's there's this concept about open mindedness and how open you are to, to changing your mind, which is critical to depolarization, really, really important. And um, uh, there's a, you know, your cognitive flexibility can be really hard and your openness to new ideas can be extremely limited, actually. And particularly for many of the people who are most active in the political sphere. So if you're a political activist, as I was, am, um, you tend to be more certain of your views and hard, take, find it harder to, to change them or be open to the idea that your experience might not be typical. It's not that it's invalid. It's just that it might not be typical. And other people, and even most other people, might be experiencing something quite different. And all of this sort of makes sense, because often the reason that people will get into politics is because they really care about something, you know, and they really want something to try and change. And they'll think that they've got the solution or they'll want something that's not the same that happened to them to, to happen to others and go from there. But the, as I say, the, the evidence is that, you know, left or right, people used to think that authoritarians found it harder to change their mind, which isn't always the same thing as being right wing, but we'll, we'll do that today. And um, uh, but actually the latest research shows that, you know, if you are politically active, the odds are you're pretty cognitively inflexible, which is not something I think most people who who engage in politics like to think. They think, oh, yeah, I'm really open minded. I could change my mind if the statistics change. And they, that's a tremendously hard thing for people to do. Yeah, it's astounding, isn't it? I mean, I um, uh, I was struck by something else in the book, too, which is, which is the kind of economy, you know, as, as a business school dean, as somebody who spent their life fundamentally, if you like, in, in business ethics and corporate responsibility and so on, I was struck by, if you like, the economy of polarization you know that yeah. what you have to say in the book about about the, the way that actually there is money to be made out of um uh, out of fueling polarization i wonder whether you could say a bit about that and, and, and really kind of what what the what is the role of business in all of this yeah so there is absolutely um money to be made in polarization you gave the example of um uh, Honda, but the one I tend to use is Marmite, you know, and it's not always that all polarization is by, but literally they reinforce whether you love it or hate it, or you love or hate people who disagree with you. My husband is a lover and I am a hater and our marriage continues to survive despite it. But, you know, like they bind that to someone's identity that, you know, that that's what's going on. It helps them sell more products. And that is a really effective way to go. Actually, once a society starts dividing, you can segment along political lines, you know, in ways that many of us will be familiar with. And sales can go up. So like Weatherspoons, I know they've had a bit more up and down since, but their sales go up as a result of having a very outspoken chief exec who was in favour of leaving because that that resonated with much of their their target audience or their target audience didn't care about it and kept going anyway. You know, and there's you can you can see how this really begins once society starts uh, taking different routes and how they do stuff, you know, and separating into these groups, it becomes even more tempting for people to market to them and entirely in their, for businesses in their own right, completely rational to do so. There's also a, a second element that underlies your question, which is, you know, how people recruit and how you build things internally. And as with many other parts of the diversity and inclusion debate, though we don't in any way argue political views should be a protected characteristic, um, that, you know, if you get everybody who thinks in the same way and they start getting groupthink, then you end up with much less scrutiny, you end up with much less innovation, you end up with things going less well, and, and people tend to pattern recruit and recruit in their own mould. So one of the most concerning studies that, that we cite in the book is actually about the recruitment of interns who are fresh out of doing undergrad degrees and in some of their cvs they mentioned that they've been involved in the republican party and in some they mentioned they've been involved in the the democrats and um what they found was that that was a much bigger predictor of whether someone got offered a job than any other factors that were mentioned though they were at similar grades and all of that kind of stuff when they were comparing and, and helpfully you know positively things like people actively tried to broaden in terms of racial characteristics with what they were recruiting but they when it came to politics people People really had blind spots and that can be a, a huge problem for businesses both in terms of internally and externally for their marketing mm -hmm. if lucrative in the short run why do you why do you think why do you think you know because because uh, as you say you know you, your much of your career has been in uh in and around politics why is political polarization as you say there's lots of other kinds of forms of stratification in society 
I was struck by, you know, a question which was around, you know, why is political polarization so intense, so emotionally felt these days relative to what it has been through history? I mean, certainly there have been times, as you say, where, you know, authoritarianism or whatever has kind of fl- flashed into view with terrible consequences. But it does yeah. feel like we live in very uh, odd times. Yeah, uh, we we definitely live in extremely odd times with um, uh, in terms of of polarization. But I think like they're not, as I said at the start, it's not it's not unique. What is slightly different is the salience with which, or the front of mindness. You mm-hmm. know, so let's take Brexit as an example. It's not always the same across the the UK, but because there is so much ongoing news and discussion about, it, and it's continuing to affect people's lives and will do so, it's not going to recede into the background mm-hmm. in the same way that that issues. You know, typically when you're outside of the general election period, like things will ebb and flow, and it allows other identities to come to the forefront so you know there are times of when other identities are being primed so for example around the olympics or around times of national holiday and things like that when people remember that they have other things in common and the political stuff will recede but that is is harder to do at the minute until last week when I used to do these these talks about the book I'd say you know often big resetting events where people were a sustained period of time and other identity is salient is a natural disaster or a war and neither of those look particularly imminent and and unfortunately mm. you know the last week has shown that that actually other things it's not that people are suddenly changing their mind for example on leave or remain but there is a common enemy and a common foe in mm. in Putin and the Russian government as unelected as it is um, for people to target. Mm. What was the most surprising thing uh, you found while researching the book? The thing that undoubtedly makes me most uncomfortable is how far your genetics can predict your politics. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, I like to think that, you know, yeah, of course, my mum and dad and my family might have have had an impact on how I do things because, they, you know, I grew up in a, you know, I was very lucky. I, I grew up without, you know being short of food or housing or anything like that Um, but actually there's increasing evidence now mainly from from twin studies that uh, you know your genetics can genetics can predispose you to certain political views more than anything else and and that's that's really uncomfortable for me certainly as we were reading it we really wanted that to not be true Um, uh, but it was and that's not suddenly for everybody to sit there and say oh my god someone's got a conservative party gene that is not that's not the situation but it's about how when something is activated so say for example in a time of threat how you respond to that and then the policies that you cling to as a consequence can you know be predicted in all sorts of things everything from like how much you support women's rights to um, uh, attitudes to free trade and all of that kind of stuff I'll, I'll stick hopefully as we're talking if I get a link to some of the more academic papers on that but it it, it made me distinctly uncomfortable but it, it was it was true um you know and I've had to update my own view on that and that's a that's a really hard thing to to do and people often cite those pages of the book that they fascinate them but they also find it makes them uncomfortable yeah and in a sense you're kind of going by your own code there aren't you in a way but by by um, accepting something that is profoundly uncomfortable to us all, and we'd all like to believe that it absolutely wasn't true. Uh, yeah. And yet, as you say, that there's a there's a body of evidence there in favour of it. So, so that that I think it feels like an authentic thing to do anyway, yeah. Alan, which is which yeah. is good. Well, <laughs> it's a hard. I still don't like it, right? <laughs> no, no, quite. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But 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 in in a sense. Yeah, in a sense, moving to the second part of the book, the first part of the book is very much, you know, why is it we get this polarisation? What can we expect in the future? What's the nature of uh, individual and group cognition? And and how is it that we find ourselves in these situations of polarisation? The second part of the book is very much about saying, okay, so we have a fractured and structured uh, society. It's polarised in the ways that it is. What can we do um, in various roles that we might occupy to try and make that a bit better? So can you say a bit about, you know, what it is, how it is that the sorts of divides and distinctions that are rather unhelpful in contemporary life might be bridged? Yes. Oh, wow. So there's a there's a few things there. And I suppose this is it's a really complex problem. It's a Gordian knot of an issue and there are no simple solutions. And part of that is like our brain likes simple solutions. We like to neatly divide things. It helps us cope with overwhelming amount of data and it has often served humans very 
very well. But we like to think of things in binary terms. And the challenge here is that that there isn't. So things that individuals can do, let's talk about individuals and then um, uh, about how people can do it on groups and also maybe leaders and institutions. So one of the things we often say is, is slow down and ask yourself, how you came to believe something and how something happens rather than why, you know, and ask that of, of others and demonstrate that you are open to changing your own mind. That how bit just is, you know, people might or might not be familiar with a concept called the illusion of explanatory depth. So people think they know a lot more about a topic than they have, they do. And once they've taken a position publicly, it's really hard to update it because it becomes part of your identity. That's something I used to exploit as a campaigner by getting people to share things on, on social media all the time. It's the downside of social proof almost. Um, but if you say to someone, hey, do you know how a zip works? You know, people will be like, yeah, I know how a zip works. I totally know. And then you say to them, okay, so can you explain to me how it works? And people start to get really confused at that point. And that's where we think we know more about this mechanistic reasoning than we, we actually do. And once you get people to a point where they say, I don't know, or, or maybe I know less about that than I did, or maybe my knowledge is not typical, that can be really important for bridging polarization. Another thing that you can do as a leader is when you see that and you can model that behavior yourself, saying, I don't know, when you genuinely don't know, rather than making up an answer, can be really powerful, um, and set an example, particularly to those more, more junior. How you construct and bring together teams can definitely be another part. And then in terms of overall as a, a society and the environment we operate in, it's really tremendously important to protect the democratic institutions that we exist in you know and there's probably I don't know how political you know if you look at the elections bill for example that's going through the UK at the minute and how it might neuter the electoral commission which is in, in effect sort of the watchdog for um, elections and make it harder to respect democratic norms then you can get into a lot of trouble and let's pick a, a current example I'm, I'm out in California so a large amount of the issue with with Donald Trump and his rise to power was that the Republican Party which had historically been a very good gatekeeper and had stopped Henry Ford who had Nazi sympathies um, getting to power in, in the 30s like it just stopped being able to act as a gatekeeper from him uh, to stop Donald Trump getting in and doing things from there and there's all sorts of these individual things which you think well on their own maybe that will get away with it but collectively they add up to an environment where someone can come in take control and then cascade polarization very quickly through society. Mm. I did. I mean, fantastic, incidentally, to see uh, lots of really interesting questions coming in. So thanks to folks who are doing that. And uh, in five minutes or so, I will begin to work through those because I think they're, they're really, really interesting topics. How did um, how did being a Bath undergrad shape how you uh, approach the book, Ali, if at all? Um, well, definitely a few things. So I was I, I was not your typical school of management student. I bunked off Freshers Week to go to a party conference. I don't know if I told you that at the time. Um, and, well, actually, I think I did because the Times and the Telegraph put me on their front page. It was quite hard to hide that I had bunked off um, uh, from going there, and which makes me quite an odd person. You know, like not many teenagers thought, I know I won't go drinking in the union and I'll go to a party conference and talk about all women shortlists. But nonetheless, that was, that was what I did. Um, and I think what actually it, it, made me really comfortable being the grit in the oyster and being the person who said something said something different and realizing that that brought real value to the conversations that we would have so you know there would be people much brighter than me looking at I know operations or um, some of the stuff around uh, like accounting or investment management but they probably didn't spend much time with someone in a room saying but what's that doing to society like that's just terrible and and actually getting challenged that way and initially I don't think people liked it very much I was probably quite annoying to be honest um, but uh, like down the line they began to really value what I did and what's been really interesting to me is as I've gone through my career the amount of friends from undergrad and I'm still I can see a number of them are actually online at the minute please limit your storytelling um and, but but like the amount of people who've come back to me and been like actually you really made me think and as time's gone on I've really appreciated what you did and what you brought to us and I think that was incredibly valuable for me realizing that that was a, a critical role that I could play and I was well suited to and I am extremely grateful to Bath for, for giving me that opportunity to do it and to you well I think I said this when I was promoting it, I nearly dropped out at the second year because I got offered quite a, a job with quite a nice salary 
and you persuaded me to stay. So I'm very grateful to you actually as well because I have well, a very different well, life. That is, that is very very kind of you, and, and I think we do we do value a, a grit in the oyster. Uh, <laughs> at Bath. I, think, I think that's a good a good expression. I might I might begin working through. I mean, I've got plenty more questions, but I might begin giving some opportunities to others to ask, ask some questions. Grace asks a question, and and, and the the heart of it she's driving at I think is is about. Um, you know, what are the circumstances in which we are likely to find ourselves cognitively flexible? Right? And we've, we've talked about some of those. You know, yeah. is it to do with how busy we are? Is it to do with, you know, how much we've got on our minds, how tired we are? Uh, you mentioned uncertainty. But what, what are, what, what as individuals are those conditions that will tend to give us the capacity to be more open minded? Yeah, so, um, well, and Grace, thank you for the, the question. I can see that she's saying, like, as the busier and with tireder we get, as a new as a new mum who said kept her up for quite a lot of the night, I could definitely tell you that um, that, that affects things. But also, um, I had a fascinating conversation with a, a very senior executive from Ernst uh, Young in Germany, and she mentioned that she starts every, every meeting often with food because she thinks that when people are hungry, um, that they are more likely to be irritable and grumpy with each other. And I thought that was a fascinating insight that more people could deploy, certainly would keep, keep me happy. But so the, the environments where you can, you know, you can spend more time, you know, things like where you get an opportunity to slow down and engage what you know people will be familiar with as system two thinking um and uh, and to take your time to look and to review things to spend time outside and outdoors to put yourself in a different environment because very often a habit will drive and force things and if you're in a different physical environment that can change how you how you feel about stuff there is definitely and i should you know explain a little bit about maybe how we we categorize and why why humans do like there's a it's an evolutionary trait which came around for really good reason to help work out for example whether all oh, these berries are red like does that likely to mean that they are safe or not safe for me to eat and the odds are that they're probably not safe because they're they're red and so you start categorizing everything that is a red berry as as not safe and then you miss out on raspberries and life is a bit sadder but in you know as the more data comes in the more you start to categorize things naturally to help you make sense of the world is something safe or not and if the internet has done one thing it is that that there is far more data flying around so actually you become more reliant on your categorization and how you do things and it's harder to be cognitively flexible in an environment where you've got stuff floating at you or throwing at you all, all the time and all around. And if you are, are tired and exhausted, that will clearly have an effect too. I've seen some research, though, as a non-caffeine drinker, I don't like or a non-coffee drinker, that drinking caffeine can increase your cognitive flexibility because it it is as grace highlighted that um uh, you know if you're tired it, it can can impact things and it can alleviate that at least in the in the short term yeah i don't i have i have flavored water because i'm in california and that's what we do here um but yes you keep drinking and being cognitively flexible i, I, I will i will <laughs> ma- i will maintain my cognitive uh, yeah. fluidity through 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 caffeine yeah. Damien asks an interesting question that really is about kind of the fact that polarization is socially complex and you know what do we know is there any kind of consensus on the causes of polarization or is there not right I mean I think he's saying look this is a really complex issue you know to what extent is there a kind of accepted wisdom of the causes of polarization yeah, so I think there is quite a lot of accepted wisdom about the causes of polarization. Where there is much less accepted wisdom is on how important each of these factors are. Mm. Um, so I will notice that journalists will often place, and there's another question I noted I saw on, on media, journalists will often think that the media is tremendously important in shaping, you know, um, uh, discourse and how people behave and how they like or or, or dislike others. And, you know, again, I'll put this in the, the comments. It's, there's a, a study that from uh, Liverpool that some guys called Florian Foods, who's at LSE did, which uh, they obviously, Liverpool in the aftermath of Hillsborough boycotted the sun um, and people didn't read it. And that had a demonstrable effect on how likely they were to support leaving or remaining in the EU. It was effectively a randomized controlled trial that was running on the ground. And it's really hard to, to test this polarization. And that's part mm-hmm. of the why it's slightly difficult to answer 
answer that. But normally you will find media people think that the media is the most important reason for polarization. I, as a movement builder, don't really agree with that and like to think what I did was more important um, because I don't like to think it's meaningless. But, you know, for example, those of you who are who are in marketing will know that, you know, if you've got a good open rate on your emails or you've got good engagement via text messages or you've got people sharing stuff and donating and giving money, then actually that can be a much more powerful way to affect how people behave and what's what's going on um uh, than than the media often me and i think that's that's wildly understudied again massively understudied the impact of search youtube is well researched um uh, and going from there another bit to the media that or, or social media or online environment that is not facebook or twitter which are a bit done to death so the the, the uh, long-winded answer or the short answer to damien's question is there is agreement on what there is there is disagreement about what is most likely to be contributing and it's really hard to do good comparative studies if anybody is up for talking like Far too much of this research is done in the US and yeah. it's the US is, is not the UK. And I am mad keen to talk to anybody who is interested in, in testing solutions. One I'd really love to test actually is on the role of humour um, and how that depolarizes. Because if you can laugh with somebody about a joke, then it makes you much less likely to dislike them. Yeah, I was struck by the, there was a German study, I think, in, uh, in the book that was about um, readers of a newspaper being asked whether they would like to sit down and have a cup of coffee with someone. The design work, yeah. 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 I, I, and I, that I was struck by just how powerful that was and just how successful it was at yeah. bringing people together. And it's fantastic. And Maria, who runs that, she's actually left design now to try and scale that. But they they try to then run that experiment in other countries. And it was often not quite as effective as what they did in Germany. And so, you know, was that the media environment? Was that Germany's history that caused that? You know, they've, they've had to they've had to practice bridging some divides in Germany in a way that yeah. in the UK, honestly, we've just not had to. Mm -hmm. Moving swiftly on, and again, this is the, there's a kind of comparative edge to this question too from Sean Stevenson McGall. Um, is there any evidence that political polarization increases in countries without proportionate voting systems? So, is there something fundamentally structural about democratic institutions and polarization? Yeah. So hello, Sean. It's lovely to see or get a question from a familiar face. Um, and uh, uh, the, so I suppose um, I would really like it to be true that proportional voting systems, of which I'm a big fan for all sorts of reasons, um, make it more likely that polarisation doesn't happen. Um, actually, the research to back that up is not super strong i mean it exists a bit but there's three pure pr systems in the world you know israel which is quite a polarized country though probably not because of its electoral system slovakia and the netherlands and the netherlands is is worth pulling out because it's really not polarized um, but you very rarely get an opportunity to test somewhere where there was uh, you know, where an electoral system has changed. And there's two examples that are reasonably recent, which work in opposite directions. So one is New Zealand, which is for many people in all sorts of ways, a place to go for hope at the minute, where polarisation has decreased despite quite tricky conversations about their history, about flags through successive governments, um, whereas, and they've had a change of electoral system during that time whilst that has gone on. Scotland has also had a change of electoral system to a more proportional one for for the nerds out there, they have STV for local government and then a different type of electoral system for almost every other election. Um, but it, it would be hard to look at Scotland and say that polarisation there has reduced or maybe that it noticeably reduces around the time of local government when they've got the most proportional system. So um, I'd really like that to be true. I'm not sure it is, but I still think proportional representation is a great idea. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because because in one sense, you, you can imagine how where you have a lot of voices that might come through a proportional system that that might lead to more polarization because those those more extreme views at the, yeah. the spectrums of things kind of equally you can imagine the value of a dialogue within a society and kind of uh, over time yeah. uh, uh, tending to be more kind of accepting and more um, inclusive and more in a way more critical in relation to to the variety of voices so I, do, I think it's a very interesting question yeah and the, I mean the Netherlands obviously and you know with Pim Fortan and stuff like that through the early noughties like what was interesting is their their effective polarization rate despite very heated a very unpleasant rhetoric um, that was going on and an assassination um, that um, actually 
groups didn't really start to hate each other too much more. And there's a, a concept in the Netherlands called poldering, which is kind of like talk it out, talk it out, talk it out, which if anybody else on the call is a Quaker, you know, I'm, I am, you know, there's, it can also have passive aggressive undertones to it. There's no doubt about that. It takes a long time to reach a decision. But I think that poldering culture has, is part of what's made the Netherlands quite resilient um, in an environment that in, in many other cases, you know, look at America, how it, it polarized very significantly. Mm. Seanad asks a question, my sense is that comes from a sort of sceptical quarter, so uh, which is really about asking you to say a bit more, uh, perhaps suggest uh, a bit further reading on uh, genetics and attitudes, opinions and polarisation. So, you know, exactly the same place you yourself came from, not, want, yeah. not wanting to accept this. Can you say a bit more about the evidence base that underpins that? Yeah, so I've stuck a, a link in the chat. So Pete Hatimi, who is, I think, at um, Yale, is um, a great person to follow his research on that. If you want to go to the original papers, I'll try and, and dig out um, uh, as well for afterwards. There's a, a great New York article, which is slightly easier to read from, I think, last year about someone, a, another researcher who actually became a pariah in the academy because of this, because it's such an uncomfortable thing for people to talk about. And the way we, we discuss it in the book is not, as I say, absolutely not, you know, I have a conservative party gene or whatever within me. It is a more to think about like how regulate, how genes interact with the environment. So it's what called your regulator genes. So if you are in an environment of, um, uh, uh, of resource scarcity where you're struggling to eat how do you react to that and what you do that that makes some sense that there might be a genetic component in how you respond to that you know and and suddenly that starts interacting with your political views of what goes on so it is not that you know suddenly you've got this political view which will predict which party you vote for it's that something can be activated by the environment around it that you can make you either maybe more authoritarian naturally in your response or maybe more liberal and open-minded and most people under an experience of threat will will automatically go to a more authoritarian response that's why the the democratic institutions are really important to try and help act as safeguards against that yeah susan asks a really good question again so again this is about uh democratic institutions um and susan's question is you, you mentioned protecting democratic democratic structures should there be more outrage about the recent succession of vetoing of openly recruited public employee appointees by UK government ministers. Is this a warning sign in, in addition to the Electoral Commission example? So again, you know, are we seeing worrying things in uh, our democratic institutions? Uh, so I'm not going to talk too much to exactly the bit about vetoing things because um, I don't know enough about it and I'm going to model my own behaviour. Um, and so, But in a more in a more you know the, the one I am more familiar with is Paul Dacre not becoming chair of Ofcom which to me feels like probably a good thing from a democratic power concentration point of view but you know and and uh, you know you could say all sorts of things about Paul Dacre very talented editor in terms of getting in getting in readers but probably not ideal for, for Ofcom chair um, but the is that a concern yes it is because it's a, a valuing of partisanship over expertise um, and that can have a, a chilling and a, a backsliding effect with what is going Going on um, and once you start going down that path and let's not pretend that the conservatives are the first people to stuff you know any d appointments with their own side of what's going on once you start going down it, it tends to become a pattern of behavior that other people pick up and it become really hard to to unwind because the new people get in and they're like you know and in some ways it's smart politics you're like well actually how can i need some of my people around so that um when we try and come back that we can do things or a, pa a system of patronage which is you know an another thing which is much stronger in america than in other parts of of the world but can be a, a huge democratic backsliding effect so yes it can contribute to polarization uh, I will ask another question by Grace before I go back to those because I, I can never knowingly not ask a question about COVID, right? So, yeah. so uh, any thoughts uh, from uh, the work you've done for the book on polarisation, COVID and vaccines? 
yes, it was eminently predictable. And I think um, so few people think of polarization in this way or, or businesses, so few businesses look at political divides. So a woman called Masha Krupankin um, did this a fascinating study where she showed under George W. Bush and under Obama. So, you know, pre, pre-Trump who bring them on the agenda, pre lots of people talking about polarization, um, people were 6% more likely to get their child vaccinated if the person they voted for was elected president. And that makes sense once you start thinking about how people trust messages and trust government. And, you know, there were there were obviously other factors going on, but she she held for those in her study. So it was eminently predictable that there would be divides um, based on how much people people trust who were saying things and vaccine take up. And so it came to pass, you know, particularly in the US, but it's not unique in this sense. Um, and I was really, you know, I, I do bits of uh, comms work and support for, for businesses sometimes at a senior level, but how little people had thought about that in terms of how they were communicating what was going on you know who are the right messengers that they can send for this who might not trust them why might they not trust them what can they do to try and and change it you know and you can see to a certain extent in in terms of the the policy response and how much people trust and and believe in government how that is directly related to covid vaccination and to to polarization and that is you know you asked me at the start when does this become a problem and it becomes a problem when people aren't getting vaccinated because they don't trust the government because they're from a different group to them yeah absolutely great couple of questions uh from omar around um you know what 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 level of polarization is optimal right we, we've we've said well you know there's there's good and bad you know in in qualitatively and, and quantitatively if we've got unstable um if we've got unstable polarization in society is there any sort of ideal level of polarization in, in any sense or or uh, or is that the wrong way of thinking about it no there's definitely a thing about and you know some groupishness can be a, a helpful thing you've not asked the question but people will sometimes be like well you know why can't we you know why do we where do we need all these groups and political parties like political parties perform a really important function like as an, an issue aggregator and people generally know that people tend to think the same thing so like it can be it's a it's an important part of a, a democracy kind of um uh doing that so um i i think that's that's one thing to think of I, i'm just noticing an omar's question i've got a slightly group of you together slightly differently to you and he asked like what's the key takeaway he could take from from this event and one of the things we'll often say to people is try and think about a time that you changed your mind and why when the environment or when information, and what caused that and you'll find very rarely will people say, oh, it was someone shouting at me, or it was somebody getting really angry at me. Be, it will be a slow confluence of things over time. And what they think changed their mind, and then when they really spend time considering it, what they actually change their mind can be quite different things, you know? Um, and it's normally that trying to open things up and, and model that is one thing that people as they're on their own and as individuals can take away with what's what's going on. And I'll just pick up, I can see his other question, which might, you might be about to come on to, which is like areas of research. He talks about societal polarization, which is a slightly less expertise in that, like mine's more in the, in the political sphere, but there is, um, I would say the direction of research and thought is far too much around social media, which is not that it's not really important, but we do not need another study from Facebook and Twitter telling you that they amplify extreme voices and they need moderates. We all know that and what's going on. Whereas, for example, Reddit, which is the 14th most popular site on the Internet, there's, there's literally no study on that that's done outside the US. There's no work looking at how trade unions can help bridge divides, which is literally often what they're set up for is to encourage some groupishness. That, like, does an effective trade union try and help reduce things with what's going on like how is the situation in Scotland uh, which is on a unionist nationalist divide how is that that different what was it that went on in Quebec that tried to help heal divides when they had a similar debate you know all of these things are, are wildly under discussed because people overly focus on social media and on on Donald Trump you know mm. and there's there's a, this huge voids of research that and I say it's because I'm at a, a university that I would be wildly excited to see some people take up and I think it's so needed Mm. I'll ask a Damien, a Damien's question, Damien's second question, uh, slightly more parochially than he's put it. So, so I'm a business school dean, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. Or, you know, we, we like to think of ourselves as a, if you like, a business school for good, right? We, we're interested yeah. in, in being positively impactful on the world in all sorts of ways. 
you're definitely not a business school for bad are you well I, we like to think not we like to think <laughs> not. but but um I, i'll leave that for others to judge but but uh, you know what 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 obligations are there on us what can we do in our pedagogy what can we do in our extracurricular activities what can we do as academics in our community to be helpful in relation to polarization so I think obviously there's some stuff that you can model as leaders, which we've touched on about like respect for expertise and making sure that you value expertise from people who think politically differently to you. There's a fascinating study, which I'll stick in the comments about like how people value expertise, even on the most basic um, exercises from people who agree with them politically more. Um, uh, so I think there's definitely some, some bits around that. Pedagogically, it's about creating an environment where students can update their position and change their mind and they can recognise the forces that, that impact them and that it is not just, it's a slightly loaded term, it's not just the rational things and it's not just based on the information. It's often about a lot a lot more than that so digging into that with people and having those conversations can be tremendously important and literally saying to students you know asking them to write essays about the last time that they changed their mind and why and what went on around it and then discussing that often in small groups can be much easier than in a big one and you know and rewarding that like you might want to think about um there's a award scheme I run with uh, Michael Crick, the journalist, and Lord Wood, Stuart Wood, called the Civility and Politics Awards, where we, we try and give some reward to someone who demonstrates the best way of engaging civilly and updating their mind and their position on something and doing so publicly in a way that encourages people to cross divides. And, and there's very little reward for people doing that. We set up a mechanism where we give some money to a non-profit in their constituency so that in effect that that charity can then say, well, hey, I, you know, we've got this because our, our MP, typically MP, was not an arse, right? And mm -hmm. they did some really good stuff and they reached out across divides. And I wondered if there's capacity for you to do the same thing, either by asking alums to do things through, through businesses or through students themselves. I know that you do a lot more kind of innovation and startup work now. That would be worth doing. And I suppose the, the final thing is to measure it, you know, like... Does anybody's teaching style actually reduce divides compared to others or accentuate them? And sometimes it's okay if they, it does, right? Like that's normal and healthy and, and yeah. important. But, you know, again, I've not even seen any particularly strong research on that outside people studying history. Yeah. It's I mean, it's a, very, it's a very interesting question, isn't it? The question of when you last changed your mind about something. Because actually, as you say, in some ways, it, it isn't... It seems to me we travel through life rather unthinkingly in a certain sense. And then, as you say, what that tends to do is kind of keep confirming the sorts of things that we're currently doing. And actually recognising when, when one's mind has been changed is actually quite an interesting intellectual exercise, it struck me. Yeah. When did you last change your mind? Well, so, really, so I thought about it, obviously, you having asked me. Um, and... <laughs> and as anybody that knows me and my girth um, would know, you know, I, I there, there, for much of my life, I was a rather healthy, in a certain sense of the word healthy, meat eater, and I love seafood and all that kind of stuff. And about three years ago, um, both my wife and I, we say vegan-ish, right? So we're not, we're not full on, my shoes are still leather, you know, but, but we haven't since then very occasionally we'll eat an egg and we're not hardcore about honey because you know frankly i'm not sure yeah. really but that does very much harm to the bees but but um but in general you know no seafood no dairy no meat no fish etc 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 and 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 really i guess the reason that that was the decision i wanted to make was was tied up with a couple of things it was tied up with revulsion for practices in current current contemporary farming particularly very intensive methods and the ways in which animals were treated and I always remember um you know because until recently we lived in Sydney and uh you know the, the local body shop there had this kind of billboard outside and it said 
still fighting for, you know, uh, animal rights, as if kind of, you know, actually we'd forgotten about that issue. And it, I thought it was quite powerful because I think some issues do do ebb and flow in yeah. their salience, and, and that's one of them. And then, of course, it's also tied to an environmental agenda, you know, like the, the climate catastrophe would be massively helped by um, more vegetarian eating broadly. And... Yeah. Uh, and then, a th- and then, thirdly, of course, it's about health, and it's about you know not not eating too much um, too much unhealthy stuff, which for me was a lot of cheese and a lot of beef. So, um, actually, you know, t- to your point, in a way, when you think about it, it's a lot of different things over time that go into that process of of a fun, you know, and not just changing something kind of small, but changing something fairly substantial. Yeah. Yeah, and and that is that's quite a big change. I'm just going to stick in the comments of an interview we did with a woman called Leah Garces, uh, mm. who's president of Mercy for Animals, that managed to persuade just on this topic a chicken farmer, um, an intensive chicken farmer in the US, to lobby to change some of the practices together. And as how was an unusual combination, they were much more likely to to bring it about. But your your story there is quite is quite typical actually the issue is also one that people come back to me on you know changing their view on on the importance of the environment or on the importance of things and and what's the dynamic that's really interesting to me is you know as a former activist or current activist is when 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 watching the look on someone's face when they realize that they've successfully changed someone's mind mm-hmm. and they successfully change their mind and their behavior by by being gentle and thoughtful and considerate about it rather than just getting right up in somebody's face. And, and the reward that they get from that encourages them to do it again. Well, on that, that is a very, very positive place, I think, for us to leave it. I am absolutely delighted to have reconnected with you, Ali, and it's been a real fantastic thing to, to read your amazing book, um uh it's it's a real tour de force i'm really really delighted that we've been able to have the event and it's been great to connect thank you to everybody who's attended and the the wonderful questions that you've asked i think we've probably had more questions uh in today's session than any of our previous uh book series so i think that says a lot about the the salience of the issues that you're tackling in this book ali so thank Thank you. you everybody we'll see you on the next one thank you